Bottom of the barrel, hey. bottom of the barrel, cause hey. the barrel is only hey. too small. Oh, uh, welcome to the bottom of the barrel, everybody. I am here with Steve Valentine. Yes. That's me. That's my. That's my sound. We're, uh, it's a, it's an early morning podcast, so we're not really drinking. Um, I'm yeah. gonna keep drinking, but I'm gonna put it in a mug. So I don't that, drink an Uber myself. Do you drink an Uber? <laughs> I think you always have to keep your wits about. Only you. when I'm driving the Uber. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew I recognized you from somewhere. Uh, well, it's good to be here at uh, bottom of the barrel. Indeed. At the literally the bottom. Cheers. 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 So this is a morning thing. So you're drinking a double dry hopped juicy tropical. Yep. Yep, the hazy IPA from Side Launch. Anything's possible. I did a show up there that a little while ago. I do. I do a lot of brewery shows lately. Yeah. I I don't know yeah. why. Like just just at a brewery, you just go stand in front. Yeah, of like a, these a guys. Bat. They're like, we can fit 120 people in here, but you are performing in front of their big bats of beer, and I'm like, oh, I'll take it. Like, Jeez, there's an old joke about like my dad died and he, he drowned in a vat of beer and he, he got out to piss three times. It's <laughs> <laughs> an old joke. <laughs> anyway, yeah, but oh, it's true though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's good to be here, man. But a brewery show. So how? So people are like already hammered before you go out. Yeah, it, for my kind of show, it works perfectly. Like it suits that. That's my people. It right. suits me. Yeah, and like I, I don't. You know, like people getting up nonstop, ordering more drinks and stuff. I just don't care. Like yeah. it's fine. They're always like, "It's gonna be all right." I'm like, "It'll be totally fine." Like yeah. I, there's really. My show is so disconnected too. There's never like a theme, so you're right. not. If you get up and take a piss, you go get a beer. You're not going to miss anything. You might miss a trick, yeah. But there's no through line. So there's no thread. No. There's no character. No. There's uh, no music. There's, no, there's music. no lighting. There's no costume design. This is all shit that's in my show. Right? Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, you know when you said you said mm -hmm. you were down in uh, at Hermosa and you uh, you just like decided to go do a, a spot like, like yeah. a real stand up. Yeah. Whereas I would have to bring a carload of. <laughs> And I'm a close-up guy, and I can do an act with a deck of cards, but lately I've been, you know, we're working on these one-man shows, and it's just too many props, man. Uh, when I, I saw you last at the castle, and yeah, you had a lot of shit. It yeah. was awesome. Yeah. But, like, just that, like, um, uh, when you're doing the one where, like, they, they're going to win, uh, you might win this uh, prize, and it's the potatoes and all that, you know, that... The whole thing like is, that, like that's crazy amount of stuff to bring just for the sight I'm, gag. And I have, I have a, now I got this, like, a suitcase table that is... Um, it looks like a big kind of a, a large wooden suitcase and it transforms into a table but it's got a table inside of it as well that's wow. the, 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 that's in la though because I, I just can't I, I swear I, I okay i need more stuff like this in my show like when i'm gonna like film something like for yeah. a, a tv uh, um or like a youtube like a big special or something i'm gonna do i always try and build it out and put more stuff in there but then when I do it, I'm like, I haven't performed with all these props in forever. Yeah. Because I, when you when you, you know how it is, especially I do a lot of corporate shows and a lot of, and a lot of colleges, it pretty much has to fit. That's how everything fits in this case right here. Yeah. And if it doesn't fit in there, it's, it's too much of a pain in the ass. Is that a Pelican Air? Yeah, that's the Pelican. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the, the one. way to go. That's the best. Pelican Air is the best. <laughs> well, you know, I met, I met up with Wilman one time. And Justin Wilman, he literally only has what he can have in a carry-on. That's his show. So he does even smaller than I do. Well, I, I get it though because I mean, I've been flying a lot. You've been flying a lot. You fly a lot. Yeah. Um, and the the thing with the luggage right now is out of control. Yeah, it's not. I've got video of piles of luggage just just sitting there at Toronto Airport, just not being manned, not being watched. Like you, I could have literally taken a couple of suitcases <laughs> and, and gone. You know. Yeah. And it's just all the stuff that's been delayed or lost. Or when I I did lose, uh, they lost my luggage one day, and I had the air tags on it, and I went back to Toronto like, a couple days later once they like got there, and they're like, oh yeah, it's where uh, your suitcase here. I show them my air tag. I'm like, yeah, and they're right. like, okay, yeah. They open up the door, and it's just like you said, just fucking mounds of it. And like, yeah, go for it. I'm like, what? So I went in there. I found my three bags. But they were in different places? Were they... uh, they're all together. Okay, and I was like, okay, I guess this is my stuff. But no one was with me. They right. just let me in there. Yeah. And I just wheeled them out. And then no, I, no at the door, I was it. like, thank you. And they're like, bye. No security, <laughs> nothing. I mean, the guy is security, but he didn't like verify my bag. I feel text. like there's a, there's a movie that starts that way. You know, where you, the guy's like, oh, let's take this suitcase. But it's got a million bucks in it or oh, something. That'd you be right. Right. Yeah, okay being that. That'd be all right. It's a classic movie trope. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's so to have it in the have it in the backpack or to have it, you know, that is... That is becoming more and more my goal. Yeah, it is. It is, but there is a time to like, to like build it up. Like if I was going to do a week at the castle, I would add a few more things, yeah. right? Because if you're going to be in one location for 15 shows or whatever, it, it makes sense. But just when you're hopping around, there's, yeah. then, then it's like the thing with all the props too is is like, and this was the the last show that I put together was like, where does everything go? 
so that you don't bump into it, knock it over. Yeah. Um, yeah. And where you're going to put something? If you're doing a 90 minute show, like yeah. my la the last one man show I did was 90 minutes, right? That's a long show. It's a lot of, and and so you got to think pocket space. You got to yeah. think like, where am I going to put stuff? Yeah. I, I've only got, you know, I actually created a bit where I just kept take, changing jackets because I needed the pocket space for the Smart. various tricks. And I was like, well, this is how I did it in 1989. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Put on an 80s jacket, but <laughs> but literally bumping into the furniture because I'm very clumsy. So so yeah. so furniture management is super important. Well, I have this. I've been. I was getting Eric Claire to help me figure out so i'm gonna film um and my my latest show it's gonna be an hour i'm just gonna post it on youtube i'm filming it at yeah. the end of uh, october okay and i was like got eric leclerc to come out and watch my show and help me figure it out and he's like you know i really think you should put this trick before that trick and uh, i'm like eric i <laughs> I'm wearing a sign on my back, so I can't take the jacket off earlier. Right. And then I have to do a trick with my shirt where I rip it off at some point. So that has to go after that. And he's like, oh, fuck. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's one of those guys where everything sort of just comes out of the case, right? Right, right. Here it right. is. There's the thing. His show called Smoke is Pocus. If you haven't had a chance to see it, I haven't seen it. you have to. It's so good. But everything's very much out of the case. Do the thing, you know. Put it in the other case. It's amazing. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm always loaded down. Because yeah. I like to seem like I don't have anything. But I do have a lot of shit. You when know? I go on stage, I have... I feel like I'm a London underground. I've got so much, you know, if you look at a map of the London underground yeah. with all the wires, oh, yeah. and there's just stuff everywhere. And I'm literally like this. So by the end of the show, I'm free because all the stuff that was in my jacket and all the weight, and I had this fake yeah. chest piece at one point, and I was doing what? the vanishing. Because you got no muscles? No, I do a bit where my nipples jump across my chest. <laughs> Are you fucking with me? <laughs> no, it's really fun. I do it as a, it, it's like a nipple um, matrix. <laughs> and uh, I had this thing made for my first show by oh, uh, Michael Azaldi in LA. He's like a spectral motion special effects guy. And, um, but it's like, I literally have to, and of course it's a fake. It's like, I remember somebody going, it's a fake chest. And I was like, what, you <laughs> think this is real, dude? My, this, my grandmother can swing her nipples over, but other than that, no, that, this is like, and uh, I actually want to stick some hair on it as well, just really in funny places. But it's, oh it's a God. fucking great a chess piece that, oh. that uh, I have to wear under a shirt over a t-shirt, under a shirt, under a jacket, oh, wow. and a waistcoat for a good 15, 20 minutes. I would sweat. I, I am. I'm like just yeah, I go like this and, and there's like streams coming out of my sleeve. You know? <laughs> oh. It's nasty. But, That's... But, it, but it's very funny. I, I go never... like this and it jumps across and then it jumps back. And I just kind of close the shirt and I open it and it jumps across and then it jumps back and it jumps across and it gets faster and faster. And finally I do it in slow motion where it goes across. It actually goes slowly across the chest. And then there's three of them. See, that's one of those ideas that people have that are like, I, I can never make this work. Right. right? Like I see it seems just like, oh, I can never figure this I out. the idea years ago. But living in LA, you know, you get to know, and being an actor, I get to know all these special effects people. Right. And so Mike's, uh, Mike Alazaldi, he's got like, spectral motion is like one of the top um, yeah. special effects places in town. Okay. They build all this stuff for um, How? for the movies and the monsters and everything. So they figured out, you know, we tried like flap nipples, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. And eventually it was a combination of pulleys and magnets. And uh, um, yeah, wow. it's an amazing thing. But it's, I mean, I haven't done it in years. But yeah, it, just because it's now it just garage. sits there. Now if someone goes over to your house, like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, <laughs> like well, get, putting it in the suitcase. They talk about getting it through customs. Yeah, but, you know, and then like it looks like I've got a torso. Oh yeah, yeah. So do you? Do, how you lived in LA a long time? Twenty years? Thirty. I moved there in eighty nine. Oh shit. We moved in uh, twenty nine. And you just came 19? back for because uh, fall of love or what? Like came back what here? Yeah, like why did you come here? <laughs> no, my my wife wanted to raise the kids here, not in LA. Ah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. So we've got a seven and an eleven year old. And yeah, so she was she was going on about it for like five or six years, and finally I'm like, all right, fine, we'll go. I said, no actor in the history of acting has ever left LA and moved to Canada. Yeah, we'll give it a shot, you know. And um, <laughs> so now you blame her and totally like, <laughs> for the destruction of my career. <laughs> no, I, I she's. It, it was it was it's, it's been really fun actually it's been very interesting we moved in 2019 and then something happened that, yeah something i don't know what went down there something, something went down yeah. um for the next two or three years but uh uh toronto's a really interesting city yeah oh so you never lived here before no you went straight no, from I'm, scotland I'm, to fucking I'm, i grew up in uh, i was born in scotland grew up near london moved, oh, okay moved to la when i was 19 20 years oh wow old. okay i didn't know and, that. yeah i just jumped on a plane and Literally just jumped on a plane and you get like a holiday visa, which was a piece of paper that you yeah. filled out at the airport back in those days. Yeah. And then just we figured out how to stay. 
Um, That's amazing. And uh, it was. And, uh, and I'd, I've met this girl and we got married in America and we got married and um, not married to her anymore. Uh, yeah, marry early, marry that often. That's the marry early, marry often. And that's my and, dad said. Uh, always keep it under ten years. Yeah. Oh, smart. <laughs> I don't know if that's smart, true. Yeah. That's what my. I'm at six so. right now. You at six? Yeah. All right. Well, there's the seven year itch. At least that what was that a sort of comedian say? I've got the seven year itch. At least I hope that's what it is. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, but yeah. So I came to LA and just kind of. I remember we just didn't know anyone or anything. Just naivety keeps you alive sometimes, right? I honestly miss uh, my uh, yeah the naivety and the overconfidence of of, of youth. Like I'm not knowing how fucking dangerous everything yeah. is every second. Oh my day. god! I even look back at even some of the shit that I took on when I was 25, 26. Yeah, and I'm like, as if I thought I could fucking do that, and right. I did. But I'm like. Man, where does where's that guy now? Where is he? I, w- I want I want he him knows back. Better, is yeah. where he is. He's in the back going, <laughs> "Don't do it." Oh my oh, god. Oh, but I, I I know and starting a month with nothing. Like yeah. no jobs, no work, zero in the in the date book, you know, and yeah. at the end of the month it, somehow it's yeah. it got filled up, you know? That like, was LA for me. It was unreal. we didn't know if we'd make the rent. I mean, we still don't. No one ever does. Yeah, yeah. The way the rents are, but that was uh, that was an experience. I remember we got on um, and I talk about it in my show, but we got to LA, my, my ex and I, and um, first apartment complex we stopped at was run by a British couple, mm-hmm. which was awesome because I didn't have any credit. I didn't have a job. They yeah. didn't have like but you got a that, work visa. You got anything. that cute accent, so you can ro- well, lean accent, on that. They were English, so they knew what it was like. Right, yeah, that's like, true. They were like, well, we'll let you rent if you promise us you'll get a job. We'll give you a break because you're English. Yeah. You know, it was total like national nepotism that's awesome it was brilliant and so then the woman i'll take it (laughs) she says to me um actually she says my day job she's like i sell stuff on rodeo drive and um i know that david or gels which is a silver antique silver place is looking for a salesperson you know i was like well i can sell anything you know i can i can bullshit it yeah (laughs) so i went down there met with them and suddenly so suddenly i'm like working on rodeo drive wild you know and so in all these old hollywood this is 89, so like Mrs. Jimmy Stewart and all these old Hollywood actors would come in to buy their Minton vases or, you know, to buy jewelry. It was really surreal. That's <clears throat> messed up. <laughs> so And then immediately, you know, you see how that half lives and immediately you're just like, I, 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 I got to get there. Well, know? when did you decide you're going to be an actor? Were you trying to do that then? Always, yeah. Okay, yeah, right out of the gate. Since I was a kid. Uh, so the idea was to go to L.A., Try and break into acting, as my friend said. Just go around knocking on doors, and then use the magic as as a way of making a living, right? Yeah. So when you say you're a magician, hilarious. Yeah, right. Everyone's like, "You're a magician. What are you gonna do for a real job?" Yeah. Get a, to support your magic. I was using the magic to support the acting, <laughs> and which was insane. I remember telling the the people that ran the apartment complex that, and they were just like, "But." The, the place that we stopped at by chance, just complete fluke, was um, half a block away from the castle. Oh, man. On Orange Drive. That is super Didn't even lucky. Know. Didn't even Unreal. Know. I asked them, I said, have you heard of this place called the Magic Castle? Because I want to see if I can audition to work there. Oh, yeah, they, just, they, just... they literally were like, come in. <laughs> see that building? Um, and uh, so what helped me in LA was just the ability to, there was a guy called EJ Thacker who was one of the hosts, one of the managers there. And uh, we had this deal, right, where basically... Um, he if, if if there was a lot of people there, yeah. he would page me. Ah, uh, yeah. Just the pay, days love of pages. It. Love it. Uh, so it was my third pager because the others were drugs. So it was the third <laughs> pager. And, um, and he would page me and then I would just run up and do extra shows down in the basement. Unreal. So I was doing oh. five or ten shows a week just for 50 bucks. Yeah. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. I give, give out my business card. Of course. I was supposed to do. And then I would just get all the jobs in Beverly Hills. That's it was that, fucking that awesome. That really just kept us alive castle was the reason oh my god that's i love that kind of thing yeah that's a clue what was okay so then when did you like how did what was your first like role when you're like oh now i my when when did your plan started working when were you like oh i'm getting some acting roles now uh i was doing um i would do these workshops which i was i wasn't happy with and then i would do acting classes and then i got like just i got a line one line on married with children oh yeah nice and then from there, uh, I started doing like all these like under five roles, where it's under that? five lines, right? So, oh, okay. Yeah, so it's co-stars. So they pay you less. And, and the idea is, the idea was, according to my agent at the time, that you build your credits yeah. that way, you know? <laughs> but I was doing these like 
here's your beer, sir. <laughs> you know, or even like I remember doing. Um, I was supposed to do something on Deep Space Nine, and it just got relegated to being an extra. And I was so I was in, oh. I'm in the Vulcan outfit. I'm like dressed as a Vulcan. I got the makeup on, oh. and in the end, I'm just like in the back going. <laughs> And I see these actors coming and I see these guest star actors coming in like bitching about everything. And I'm like, if you only knew yeah. how much I want to be where you are right oh. now. And then I would do magic shows for like big celebrities and producers and directors. Yeah. But they didn't take me seriously because I was doing Magician. magic shows for them. You know, like you did my kids bar mitzvah. What do you mean you're an actor? You know, so uh, um, I, remember oh, I would God. every every holidays I would do like Lawrence Kasdan's holiday party. And I love He was lovely. And I bet that'd be a good guest list. It was great. One, one, because um, he would invite specifically uh, the cast of various movies. So, right, um, the Big Chill. I remember one of yeah. the one from the Big Chill was there. Cool. There's just caviar. You know, some houses there's caviar everywhere. Some yeah. houses there's cocaine everywhere. Yeah. You just kind of go with the flow. Of and you don't want to be rude in either house, you right? Don't want you want to just, say no. Yeah, I mean that's just um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he, uh, that's always a fun. You know, when you do the salt trick. Like salt pork, but you do it with <laughs> you act like you just take a little bit of, a little bit of cocaine and yeah. but watch this and it starts pouring and it doesn't stop oh. <laughs> you see these guys and they're like what that's very cruel uh, but yeah. um you're uh, like dude I wouldn't even do this if I could do this for real like you think I'm looking for jobs I mean obviously thank yeah. you Come on. so I, I remember saying to Kasdan uh, you know I, that uh, I'm also an actor and um, I think the term also an actor is not a good thing to say yeah that's, that's, that's like, a hard you know, that's a, a hard chef, hill to I'm also an actor I'm a juggler I'm a whatever I'm doesn't doesn't work so I remember his eyes glazing over um oh yeah you must because you must hear that shit all the time too. yeah yeah and so I I ended up um I want, a couple of things happened I ended up quitting magic for for a number of years because I felt it was getting in the way yeah and I said to my agent at the time I was doing like married with no, married, was it married with children men behaving badly and some soap opera for a little bit but I was like I want to do I want to move up. I want to do yeah. guest star roles, recurring guest star roles, series regulars. And I'm not going to do that if I'm doing these small lines. That's how everybody sees me. Yeah. You know, so you look at how you're perceived and you have to change that. And I remember him saying like, but you're making, you're doing really well. You're making money. You're like, yeah. you're the guy. Everyone knows you can handle this. Yeah. Like, yeah. But you know, so you want to level up. You want to yeah, go to the next So thing. I started turning down those. So Oof. I wasn't going to do those anymore. Nice. Right. Oof. And then I moved and I'm like, just guest stars, recurring guest stars and series regulars. Um, and so then I started doing guest stars and then I was list and then at one point I said, I just recurring characters now uh, or a series regular. I got to that point where that's fucking cool. Yeah. But it's, it's ballsy, right? Cause and again, naivety, arrogance, yeah. Yeah. whatever it is. How old are you at this point? 30? <clears throat> uh, I think my, my crossing Jordan came at. Because that was your first big regular... Like, I did a sitcom before that called Nikki oh, on okay. the WB with Nikki Cox. Okay. And um, and then uh, and then Crossing Jordan. But it's interesting. The reason I got Crossing Jordan was because one of the actors on Nikki... So I I was asked to do Nikki at the same time I was offered a movie. The movie didn't pay anything, but was a good independent film. Oh. And Nikki was WB sitcom. Right. You know, it was not art, but <laughs> it, was, it was produced by Bruce Helford. <laughs> it's not, right? It is, you know. Um, and it, it was a funny concept, and, um, and it was going to be a recurring character, at least at the beginning. And um, I remember having to explain to the producer of the, of the independent film, like, that I'm going to... I need to take this job because they're actually going to pay me yeah. like eight grand a week. And you fuck us. Yeah. You know? And I'm like, I'm not making anything on this movie. They didn't understand. They held it against me. In fact, some of the people involved in that still hold it against me. But, Insane. Yeah. But you, you, you know, you have to make those decisions. So then I did that show. And then one of the actors on that show, one of the recurring characters um, came in one day and he said, uh, Hey man, I just, I just auditioned for a part. And he said, I'm, I sucked. I was really bad trying to do a British accent and everything. He says, but you'd be perfect for it. Yeah. <laughs> the untitled Tim Kring project. Go tell your agent about it. So uh, I go to my agent and of course they've never heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and so uh, they get me the audition. They actually managed to get me an audition and then I ended up getting the getting the part as a recurring guest star. That's cool. Yeah. <sighs> it's But even then, when the show got picked up after the pilot, and they were like, we want Steve for the second episode. They offered me half the money that they paid me for the pilot. 
which is common. You get paid twice as much for a pilot usually. I didn't. Fuck. No. Yeah. Well, you they don't do it anymore. <laughs> okay. But it used to be like if you're going to get say thirty thousand dollars an episode. Oh. Okay. Right, they'll pay you sixty for the pilot to hold you to that show. Now they don't give a shit. Yeah. Now they don't care at all. Good luck getting another show. Yeah. Exactly. Um. So, but oh. I, me- I remember them calling and saying like, uh, uh, we're going to pay him this for another episode, and I and I had just done five finished five national commercial different national commercials I was right and this campaign for cheese where i was the chef and um we were talking about <laughs> this, is, this is like the life of an actor i'm gonna be the i'm gonna be the chef on a cheese commercial no, as soon as you said it i can picture it i'm like yeah, yeah you do look like a che- yeah. chef yeah it was a cheese chef <laughs> and and i just and I, so i said um they've got no i said they've got to pay me what they paid me in the pilot oh fuck and otherwise i'm not gonna do it and my agent was like, are you crazy? This is NBC. And I said, yeah, but it's a, it's a guest star. And I shudder now. Yeah. You know, um, and finally they said, okay, we'll, we'll pay him that. So wow. I went in and did it. And then I just got on so well with everybody. They, they were writing for my character. And then by the fifth episode, they, were, they, they offered me the, the regular part. That is fucking awesome. But looking back at that moment where I was like, I got five national commercials running, uh, you know, yeah. pay me what I'm worth. Or at least pay me, don't pay oh, me half what you paid me before. That's such a, again, like that, we just said it, because that's, that's the move, man. That's fucking crazy. But you would never do that now. No, I would never do that now. <laughs> you never do that. I would be like, oh, you're, and you're going to pay me? <laughs> oh, okay. I did it once for Disney and it backfired. I, I, it backfires every now and again. Yeah. Uh, I remember... <laughs> I've never talked about this. I was, and I'm not even drinking. Um, but I did uh, this uh, this series of Tinkerbell movies, right? There were these Tinkerbell movies, okay, cartoon animated cartoons. They did very well for Disney. So the first one comes out, and I'm doing a voice for the Minister of Spring, okay. And um, then they're going to do the second one, and I was Minister of Spring there. And then the third one, they wanted me to do one of the main voices, like the dad of one of the kids, okay. and it was a major role. And and I was like, yeah, great. I, I, and they said, but your credit is going to be like with a bunch of other people in the back of the of the movie, like when they go like additional voices by. Oh, and okay. See, you know, and I was like, but this is a, I, I should have oh you know, wow your own screen yeah. Well, it, it's just like you know, I said you've got all these other people that like, that yeah, the character the name, name and their name, and their name of course, yeah. And and I said for me like that's a big step up. Like I I putting me with I didn't understand why. And I still don't understand crediting sometimes. Yeah. Um, but why they wanted to just push me, put me with a bunch of other names. Oh. So I think it was like $25,000 job. And I said to my agent, no, I want the proper credit. Yeah. I think it's only fair. I don't, I don't understand why they just won't, you know. And they said no. You know. And they never came back. And yeah. I didn't do any more. Uh, for, for our TV show, Big Trick Energy. Yeah. Chris uh ramsey and myself we created the show and ian frisch was the guy who introduced us to the production company and sort of had the show made yeah and in the final thing it's uh the credits are created by ian frisch and chris ramsey and i was like but i wrote like most of it like i created all, like l- the concept up is like all me- i'm like what the fuck and, and then that make you feel man uh, yeah and they were like hey if you push this it's gonna go away that's basically what the agent told me and I was like, all right. So I let it ride. I let it go. They're like, like, you just don't fight this. This is it, there's a lot going on. Like, so. I, and I don't understand what the problem is. One more fucking name. One, it has to do with uh, either residuals. It is residuals. It's back end shit. Back end shit. It, it, it could be divided among. Like I've taken shows to pitch to production companies where they're like, there's too many people involved. Yeah. You know? Fuck, that, like, that's what it was. Yeah. No, like, oh. Because once you start dividing that pie and, and with reality television, yeah. it's smaller anyway. When well, they're like, we got four hosts already. What are, you're going to get credit. Now we're going to get the other guys where they're all created by. Like we can't give all of you producer credits. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, there are four of us. And I, I just wanted to get a goddamn TV show. Right. So yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. yep, let's go. But I'm like, I, what I sold the show. I sold a show to uh, uh, the first show I ever, I ever sold was um, I came off of Crossing Jordan and I remember I was at a party and I, and I wasn't, getting auditions i wasn't working now and when you're used to working for like six years like all the time you know every week with an episode it, you 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 kind of get a little <laughs> like that's it my career's over i'm like what yeah. the hell am i gonna do now and i was getting a bit sensitive every time i went to this one restaurant the, the owner would be like so 
what's coming next for you? Oh, I'd be no. like, stop asking me that. <laughs> Will you stop asking me that question? I don't know. So this one woman comes up to me at a party and she's like, have you read the books? She's like, what, what are you going to do with your career now? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I got to ask you like it's your choice. Yeah, that, that's what people not in show business ask you, right? Yeah. They always go like, why don't you do a movie with Tom Cruise? I don't get it. What's this, you know, Hallmark shit? Um, so I'm like, thanks, good idea there. Auntie, auntie. Um, so this woman comes up and she's like, oh, wait, um, have you read these books called The Gourmet Detective? And I said, no. And she said, well, they're, they're good. She said, but I could see you as the lead character. You should see if you can get the rights. And then she vanished into the party. And I, and I was like, okay, so I went home that night. I found the books, read them. They're good, not great, they're good. I love the title. It's about, it's, about, it's like murder he cooked, right? So yeah. it's just like, I'm like, this feels like a USA show. Yeah. USA Network. And, um, and so I, I, uh, I found the agent online hmm. and I sent him an email. And I just was like, I don't know how to do this. It's, I'm new to this whole thing of like getting the rights to books, but. And I don't have like a ton of money to pay you, but I think it could be a really good series. And he said, uh, I'd love to do this with Peter because the author was in his 90s. Oh, wow. And he said, um, about a couple of grand just for all eight books. Um, and I was like, yes, absolutely. So, uh, but here was the weird thing. I could only get seven books because the first book, the one with the title Gourmet Detective was owned by a British publisher. No. So the, my, we, we strike the deal for the seven and my lawyer now is like reaching out to the guy in England and he's not responding. He does, he's not interested or he comes back and wants way too much money. And so uh, the, the um, lawyer calls me up and goes, so yeah, maybe you can call them and just pitch them on your passion for the project or something. And I was like, sure, what's the guy's name? And he goes, Martin Brees. And I said, Martin Brees? Like, there's a magic dealer in the 80s called Martin Brees. <laughs> no way. And he published a number of books and he got the rights to a lot of the Al-Quran stuff. And you can go online now. He's, he passed away, but but he's, there's another guy who bought his martinbrees.com. Can't be the same Martin Can't Brees. Can't be. Because <laughs> I, I used to go to his shop in like uh, uh, 84, 85. I would go buy stuff at oh, his shop. I love this. And it uh, turns out it was the same guy. That's fucking cool. So I'm like, <laughs> This is so, I said, you won't remember me. I said, but I used to come in once a week and I, I was working in Yugoslavia, another story. I said, but I used to come in uh, and buy new tricks all the time. I got, I got the M wallet from you, Paul Brignall's trick. I got like Max Maven's packet tricks. I got like, and, and so we had this whole conversation at the end of it. He was like, it's all right, all right. He says, we'll, we'll let you use the book. So we, we made the Whoa. deal. But what are the odds? That is unreal. Martin Brees, yeah. I can't let the Yugoslavia go. <laughs> That's all I heard. Can I, I? I do. I do a piece about it in my uh, in my. Anyway, just to finish that, yeah, is please, we ended please, up please. selling that to USA Network. That's um, cool. And uh, it didn't get made, and then finally we sold it to years later to Hallmark. I think people don't understand how many things get sold and not made. You know what I mean? Like people have very crazy. good careers just writing two or three pilots a year. Yeah. But and literally nothing ever gets ever out gets to the seen. Yeah. And, that, and I think that's an issue because at the end of it, you have nothing to show for your work. Yeah. Like I've developed so many series. Um, and then people are like, well, you haven't done anything for a while. I'm like, you have no I, idea. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I had a series about Houdini and Conan Doyle, which we sold to Sci-Fi Network in 2011. Oh, dope. Right before the big kind of upswing and period stuff on TV. Man. And it was Houdini and Doyle. It's uh, such a good story in general, and, and you well, and you when you finish. Uh... Yeah, we want we wanted to do my writing partner and I, Paul Chart, had done Children of Men, and he he wanted to make it really dark and edgy. Like, oh, none fuck of, yeah! None of the usual kind of like oh, who like Conan Doyle's like Sherlock Holmes. It's like yeah. no, he's not. That's the yeah. whole point. It's, it's not kind of a bumbling <laughs> uh, Murdoch mysteries bullshit. None yeah, of that, right? No, none of yeah. that. But but and Houdini is it, anyway. So we had this idea. We wrote a terrific pilot. Um, sci-fi didn't they bought it and then they didn't quite remember what they bought <laughs> just like uh. the executive once i was like can we go over your notes because they're not making sense and he literally said to me i actually don't can you repitch the pilot to me oh my god right you know yeah so I ended up selling it again to nbc um and then nbc wasn't sure that period pieces were going to work right this is oh right god. when right when sherlock holmes um uh, Guy Ritchie was coming out with his Sherlock Holmes. So I remember saying to them, because they were like, yeah, we love the script because we had like steampunk in there and yeah. it was really fun. And um, and so I said, well, 
wait i said i think the guy ritchie thing is going to be huge and they were like well if that does well we'll you know then we'll, we'll really consider putting it on the air and so we and they paid us to write the pilot right yeah so guy ritchie explodes with sherlock Holmes, oh my god yeah. it comes back and their response was yeah but that's guy ritchie <laughs> and um you can't bloody win oh. so <clears throat> in the end um it went it went dark you know as they say and and uh, it didn't happen and then i was able to get the rights i was able to get the rights back or at least get a, a, a document saying that if someone else was to pay a certain amount of money that we could get the rights back which i later found out i didn't need to do because these were historical characters oh right. and right uh, yeah so then um but i got the thing back and so now i'm like going around town trying to sell it i sell, send it to fox i send it to all these other places and then suddenly i see an announcement that fox is doing a show about harry houdini and arthur conan doyle uh investigating what? psychics and solving crimes what the fuck yeah. Well, I didn't ever. I never. What, what show was that? It was on for like a year. Oh, okay. It was, on the, it was on Fox. But they did it the shit version, right? They didn't do the fucking they dark, did, they, gritty they, version. They did like the network television yeah. version. Um, and I remember, and it was such a weird feeling because I, I managed to get hold of a copy of the script, and it was nothing like ours. Yeah. I mean, almost, almost to a fault, nothing like ours. So it, was very, <laughs> it was very possible that they just heard the concept and wanted to do their own version. Totally. Which happens in Hollywood all the time. Yeah. So I'm up at the castle, and, and this is such a Hollywood thing, right? So I'm up at the castle, and uh, I'm in the Palace of Mystery, and I look behind me, and there's one of the showrunners from House. Yeah. A lovely guy. Um, and he's there with a bunch of people. And so we say hi, and I'd done an episode of House where I played a magician. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Like, did that happen often that you end up playing a magician? On no, because only when I decided to kind of re-embrace magic back into my life. But I was that was also because that, that House episode, like you are the episode. It's about your you swallowed a key or some shit, yeah, right? Yeah, like, and, that's yeah, yeah. Great. It was <laughs> that was really fun. But that was the first time I'd played a magician on TV in a long time because I was like, I don't do magic anymore and yeah. I'm not playing magicians, you know? Uh, and then I ended up doing a ton of them. Yeah. But uh, so I look behind me and, and and this guy's there and we start talking and he goes, he's like, I'm like, what are, you, what are you doing up here tonight? And he goes, oh, he says, well, I'm running a new show. He said, I didn't create it. I didn't write it and create it. He said, but they brought me in to run it. It's about Harry Houdini and Conan Doyle and we're making it for Fox and I've just brought all the writers up to... You know, and, and I'm just, so I said to him, I was like, did you, have you heard about the show that I sold to NBC? And he, and he literally just had no idea what you're talking about. So I said, well, I said, um, I said, uh, here's the thing. I said, obviously our show's dead, but um, he was such a lovely guy. I was like, who's your Houdini expert? Because Pat Carleton's the guy, I'll give you his number. I said, well, we don't really have a Houdini expert. I said, well, you should just need one. <laughs> I said, who's your Conan Doyle uh, uh, expert? Because you should have, you know, they didn't have a Conan Doyle. They were just kind of making it up as they went along. And, um, and you know, that's 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 Hollywood, right? Yeah. I, I had these, I was angry. I was, um, I was also just kind of like, well, hey, move on to the next. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I still think to this day our script was could should be made because it's oh man way I wouldn't say better but yeah it would be really good for like a Netflix for like a where you can do a bit where you can actually do yeah we would do stuff like well they proved it themselves they went one year and died they then yours yeah yeah like, <laughs> it wasn't gonna be worse than that <laughs> oh, oh what a shame <laughs> uh, yeah ah oh, man I I. Uh, I'm I'm not in that world enough, um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's very very weird. And, and then the shit that doesn't get made is always criminal, and yeah. the shit that does uh, that gets made and then and then dies, like you know, some of your favorite shows ever will run one or two seasons and they get canceled. You're like, yeah. And there's never any uh, there's never any satisfaction there. There's no uh, the, even the people that are closest to it. You're never gonna hear why or anything. It's all bullshit. Nobody gives you an honest answer. Yeah. Nobody even says no. They just don't get back to you. Yeah, they just you, ghost they, you. They, they, yeah, that's yeah. where it started, man. It started with the uh, TV executives 100%. where you pitch them. We'll let you know, and they don't. My my, they don't. I got it. I got, I got hit up the other day, and they're like, "Hey, who 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 reps you?" And I'm like, "I don't think anybody anymore." <laughs> Let me check. And yeah, they're like, I'm like, I send emails into this void. Apparently, I have a, a management team, but I don't think they. That's even, very common. I think That's they. Common. I think they put me in what the spam. What you always folder. hear is, I generate all my own work, man. <laughs> yeah. But that you, but you need to have that rep just to say that you have rep. Um, and the reason I told you the 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 um, 
gourmet detective thing was because I planned to play the lead, right. and you were talking about this with your show, and I was like, I'm I'm doing this. I'm playing the lead, no matter what. Oh, right? Oh, yep. And I I got the show and I'm attached by complete fluke. And again, this is just the naivety of like. I'd done an episode of Monk where I played a magician. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. And um, and the director, a showrunner, was uh, dating a friend of mine. Yeah, and which was a nice coincidence. So um, I got to know him a little bit while I was doing the show, and then um, so I called the studio and I was and I said uh, I called Paramount. I just called Paramount Studios, and I was like, uh, "Can I get uh, Randy Zisk's office uh, on the Monk uh, set, please?" And they were like, sure, put you right through. They put <laughs> me through it. to Randy's office. Right? So you can't get through the gate. Yeah. But you can call. <laughs> so Randy picks up and I'm like, hey, it's Valentine. Um, I've got a project I want to talk to you about that I'd love to bring yeah. to USA. And I know that Monk is ending. I don't, I'm sure you've got stuff planned, but can we have lunch and talk about it? And he was like, well, I'm busy, but yeah, okay. So I pitched it to him and he's like, I love it. He's like, okay, I'll add this to my plate. So, and I said, I, I want, he said, I assume you want to play the part. And I was like, yes. And he's like, okay. And he goes, and you know what? If, if we sell it and they don't want you for it, they can go stop it. We'll take it somewhere else. I'm like, oh, that's, oh, yeah, that's great. Cool. So we go, we sell it to USA. And USA, uh, as our first pitch was USA. And they say, well, we don't know that you're right for the part because we don't have a script and we want to have the option to bring in a bigger name. And, uh, and so Randy and I have a meeting and he's like, do you want me to just, we'll just quit it and we'll just move on to another pitch? And I was like, no. No, I, I, it's okay. I'll be a producer. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll write it. I'll, I'll be an executive producer. We'll get somebody else. And that's <laughs> like, fine. How quickly you were like, no, that's fine. Yeah, because like, I, I started off with, I'm the fucking star. <laughs> and then I ended up with, no, if you, you want to give somebody else, that's fine with me. <laughs> Just, you know, if you want to buy it, yeah. Of course, you know, once you get in that situation, yeah. and especially if you think from the perspective of a, of a producer versus an actor, yeah, suddenly the, the hedge shifts right and yeah. now you're like okay i want what's best for the show and i'm sure there's going to be an actor that's going to be better for the show so yeah and yeah. and just um more is more in hollywood so like if you make that and you're just a producer or whatever like you have just a little bit more to push the next thing you want through a little you know what i mean mm -hmm. like everything's better more is more <laughs> more is more i don't know and uh, you always have to be doing something mm -hmm. it doesn't matter in england i feel like you can have a, a a body of work and you're known for that and uh whereas uh i feel like in america it's what are you doing now what it's are you doing next it's interesting that you never really tried it over there then you just right away you're like fuck it america american dream yeah i just did theater i did theater uh, and, and magic over there yeah and um i just had a friend of mine suggest one day that uh, uh that you know we should all go over and knock on doors and yeah show them how it's done yeah you, yeah, yeah. So I thought, well, okay. And then I just did it. I had, she literally said to me, you have nothing going on here. You have nothing keeping you here. And I was like, oh, thanks. That's that's great. Uh, but it was true, you know. And um, who's the biggest, like, star you've had to share a scene with? Who, have, you ever, have you had to do any, I mean, like, fucking, even in house, that's that's pretty that's pretty heavy. Uh, he was right amazing. Yeah. Um, I think I remember doing a movie, having a scene with Albert Brooks. I'm a huge fan of Albert oh, Brooks. Oh, wow, yeah. And I did a movie called The Muse. And he was lovely, and and uh, I mean, I know his movies backwards. I'm a huge Albert Brooks. Oh, wow, that must be hard then. So for me, and I noticed that even though we were, we he was directing it. So when we were doing the scene, he was super aware still of like where. And as soon as we fi finished the scene, he was like, "We need more extras back over there." Like he was oh, just wow. like he's a brilliant guy. He called me at home like a, a couple of weeks after I did the finished the movie, and um, he was going to go on the Tonight Show. And he said, I'm going to do this sketch, he said, with a, with a parrot, as if I'm a ventriloquial parrot. And he said, I want you to do the voice of the parrot. Oh, it's going to, he said, it's going to be really funny because it's obviously I'm not doing it, but I'm going to great. pretend that I am. And uh, I was like, yes, of that course. But odd. it ended up not happening. Oh, man. I was so upset. Um, but he was great. I mean, I think... The Walk was an interesting movie. That's where I met Chris when I was in Montreal shooting The Walk. Oh, right. Yeah. Because that had people like Ben Kingsley in it. It was directed by Robert Zemeckis. Yeah. Like a, like a really nice big cast. Yeah. Uh, I think, I guess Sharon Stone was in was in the Albert Brooks movie. So huh. she was pretty big. Did you ever, did you end up doing any of the, the talk show circuit stuff? Like, did you ever get on any of them? I did. Um, I didn't do the Tonight Show or anything like that, but I did uh, a lot of the daytime stuff. The oh, Dick okay. Clark had a show. 
Right. And uh, uh, with Danny Bonaducci. Oh you remember the club yeah. Danny Bond? There's, there's a couple. Whoa, that's and weird. and then I did because I got a publicist. You get a publicist when you do a TV. Everyone says you need one. Yeah, it's super expensive. Yeah, it's like three grand a month. At Holy least shit! Balls. In order to like promote that you're on a series, and I really wanted to just get like I wanted to get on talk shows and I wanted to get articles and just kind of promote that the character was popular and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um. Uh. But I ended up doing. Uh, kind of mid-range daytime talk shows and uh, and it was fun and I came over here to do Mike Bullard's show oh back in the day damn uh, and the only reason I got on was because the SARS epidemic was happening <laughs> and no one wanted to come here and I was like <laughs> I'll, do it. It, I'll go <laughs> so I remember oh, man, coming Mike through Bullard. the airport and um, the immigration guy saying uh, so why, why are you coming into Toronto and I'm like well, I'm doing a talk show and he goes doing a talk show and like, yeah, Mike Bullard. And he goes, oh, you watch yourself, man. Watch yourself. He, he'll get you. He'll get you. What? He's, he's funny. He'll be your friend. And then he's going to turn around. He's going to make you look stupid. So you, you watch yourself. I was like terrified by the time I got to set. Um, yeah. Oh, man. I forgot about Mike Bullard's show. That's, yeah, that's good shit. Yeah, he's a Canadian legend, that guy. Yeah, yeah. I just There was a, just a, a documentary about stand-ups that uh, I went to see a screening of mm. uh, that was really good. And is he in that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah all the Canadian stand-ups. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, did you say a TIFF or what? No, they oh. had a, a screening out in, um, I think, Hamilton. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, at some theater. Right? I never, yeah. I, oh, that's not, I like, I, I'll watch anything to do with stand-ups. I love that, the, especially like if it's like about that old, you know, uh, old generation. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but like, I, I love watching, I'm obviously like, uh, Jerry Seinfeld had his fucking uh documentary years ago that right. made uh, made comedy popular again but like even like uh, they, then Jim Carrey produced a show called I'm Dying Up Here it's not a documentary but it's about the uh, basically it's about the comedy store in like the 80s or whatever you know like I, I, any of that kind of shit that era of stand up such a is fucking cool yeah I love it I'm, I, I think I it's so cool I hear people talk about yuck yucks all the time here yeah. in Canada and how just what a what a stranglehold that place had on oh yeah if you want to be a comedian in canada you don't piss off yuck yucks yeah you know? and, and and there's these stories and as an outsider you're just like go tell them go fuck themselves like, yeah you know go do your own career like you don't and yet people get sucked into that yeah that codependency because it's, it, it, it's one of those things where um our careers have no template there's no like oh go here do this training get this job kind yeah, of thing right yeah so uh, comedy clubs and franchises like Yuck Yucks offer a modicum of that mm -hmm. and people just can't help but be like, oh good, here's a, well, a we path all, that we, we follow. We want acceptance, don't we? Yeah. I mean, that's why we're doing it. We want applause, we want acceptance, we want someone to tell us that we're good. Yeah. Like, when I did The Walk and we're shooting in Montreal, mm -hmm. I'm in a movie with Ben Kingsley and all these other like Oscar-winning actors and the whole time I'm just like, don't mess up, don't mess up, don't be the worst thing in the movie. Yeah. You know, I'm almost like psyching myself out. And all I wanted at the end of every scene was for Bob Zemeckis to look at me and go. That's all I wanted. <laughs> he was like dad, right? And you just wanted to go, that, that was good. That was, that, that was good. He called me when I got the part. And I, I'll never forget this because I'd auditioned for it. And then I got a call saying, you're Bob's choice, but the studio wants a bigger name. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. But the fact, and, but they said, and, but he's going to go to bat for you. Nice. And I thought, I don't care if I get the part now. The mm. idea that Robert Zemeckis, like the director of like some of my favorite movies of all time, yeah, like actually thinks I'm good enough to to go to bat for. That's fucking great. Yeah. So he calls me. He's got no idea I do magic, right? Because I I don't promote the two together. Smart. And so, so he's on the phone with me. He literally says this. So this character you're playing, Steve. Um, uh, He's, it was this guy in the, I don't know if you saw the documentary Man on Wire, but it was the mm -hmm. character with the giant mustache. Oh, yeah. It was that, like, that, you know, that guy with the New York. I was going to ask, oh, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, the very thick accent. So he goes, um, so this character, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's an unusual man. He's a weird guy. He's kind of, he's kind of out of his time. He doesn't really fit in anywhere. He, has, he said, I don't know if you've ever been to a place in LA called the Magic Castle, but he's like those magicians that are hanging in the shadows and they don't you just they don't quite fit in, you know. And I'm just literally Did you not tell him at that point? No, no. I was like, Yeah, yeah I've been there. I know what you mean. I know what you oh mean. Oh my god. Because you're literally that guy. Like no wonder he felt that. He's like I guess he felt the that I don't fit in anywhere and I'm, yeah. I'm that guy. Yeah. 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 That's fucking crazy. That's oh, wow. so cool. 
So he was he was amazing. Oh man, he, he was lovely. We talked about a lot of conspiracy theories at the time because you know the show was uh, it's the Twin Towers. Yeah, and uh, the guy just puts the wire between the Twin Towers. Yeah. and walks across. So they there was a lot. He actually said to me at one point, he came to set, we used to go to uh, back to the hotel afterwards and watch Zemeckis movies, yeah. the cast. And then we would try and figure out, oh, we did that that shot. That's a Zemeckis shot. We did that today. Yeah. You know, oh, he, yeah, he, we did that a couple of days ago. And uh, he found out we were watching his movies. And he was like, you can ask us. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, uh, he said I hear you're, uh, you're watching my films. <laughs> yeah. said, well, you can ask me anything about any of them and I'll tell you, I'll give you an honest answer. So then we just started picking his brains about Whoa. like stuff that happened on set. And, and it was great. That's awesome. Was, yeah. That, the moments. Uh, man, that makes me happy. Did you put a lot of thought, because I'm kind of hung up on this uh, idea of like why he sensed, that even though he didn't know you're a magician, why he sensed that about you did you put a lot of thought in curating your look as an actor like you're like i better keep my hair long i better have the mustache i better be i didn't okay because uh, you are very unique like like chris always makes fun of me he's like he says i look like every extra in saving private ryan or something so like, you're just <laughs> the most boring guy they did but a, you always work they did and that's the thing that's they, the problem the, some guy did a cartoon of of the four of us for our tv show right it's yeah. just like but it's like one of those like abstract ones where it's like minimalist yes so like when you look at it though, legitimately, there's Eric with like glasses. Alex has a beard and his hair. Chris has a beard and hair and some tattoos. Mine is faceless, like bland. No, not bland. Like there's nothing. It's just <laughs> an oval, true, a white oval of a face, and that's and that's, everyone's like, yeah, that's Wes. That's insulting. I know. That's I knew. Insane. I didn't even have this scruff going back then, so I was just nothing. The guy's like, yeah, I have nothing to paint here. Oh man, no. So, I, 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 just, I had a guy come up to me at an acting class once before I got my uh, first break, and he. Um, and I, I've talked about this before. He never, I'll never forget this. He said to me, he said, uh, so you, uh, you think you're going to make it? <laughs> he says, what do you, where do you see your career? You know? And I'm like, well, I hope, I hope to get something at some point. Yeah. Why? I always had this kind of quiet confidence that at some point something will come along that's right. Sure. And he goes, well, he says, uh, he says, look at me. He says, look, he says, I'm short, I'm fat, I'm Jewish. He says, I can play doctors, I can play lawyers. <laughs> I can do all these roles. Right? Yeah. He says, I'm always going to work. He said, you're tall, you're real. I was really skinny at the time. He said, you're tall, you got skinny, you've got long hair, big forehead. He said, I just like, it's, you, the kinds of roles that you play would be super unique or different, yeah. like not consistently, you know. But like not, magician, villain, vampire, right. that's you. So I said, <laughs> so, I, so I said, so I was really like, but I was really angry with the guy. But I said, I just said to him, look, I said, I, I have confidence that at some point, yeah. something will come along. I said, I know Jack Nicholson. I've read a lot of biographies. Nicholson couldn't get work because he was so Nicholson. Yeah. And then he eventually became his own type. Yeah. So I said, I'll, I'll you know, I'll just keep hammering away. Thanks. You yeah. Know? And a year later, I got Crossing Jordan. Yeah. So yeah, and exactly. He came as a guest star on, on, <laughs> my, on my show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that feels nice. That, was fun. that feels really. That was fun. Nice. I was very nice. I was very welcoming. What actors do you think that you, uh, you know what I mean? Like people have those like guys like, oh yeah, like if, if, if he was dead, I could maybe have that role kind of thing. Who, who's sort of your actors that are kind of... Well, there's, there's, there's those people that you always compete with right. that get the roles that you want. Right. You know, uh, there was a time, and, and he's brilliant, so uh, 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 there was a time when I would often get um, mistaken for Richard E. Grant. Uh, you know, people no, thought no. I was in the Spice Girls movie, which I wasn't. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> And what happened was, when you're talking about looks, is I did a role where I had my hair was like super long and all one length. Yeah. And um, I did a role in that. And then I would go and audition for something else. And they'd be like, yeah, we like your hair the way it is. And so if you look at most of my stuff, I have the same haircut for like 20 years. Whoa. Because everyone just goes, that suits that's, you. Yeah, that's great for the character. Yeah. So when I did Crossing Jordan, um, I had the bob, like all one length page boy cut, you know, and they were like, yeah, we like that. I was like, so for six years, I had to have that same haircut, even though we did slight variations on it. Oh my God. Um, and so when that show was over, I cut my hair and yeah. uh, short and then didn't work for years. No. And, um, <laughs> but it, it's, you know, I, I think that became, I guess, my image, my look. Yeah. Like a straight Chris Angel. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. some, sometimes I do sometimes I do jokes just for me they're, no, from, no, they're for me and one other person I, I, that's yeah. all no I think Chris would appreciate that no 
Uh, uh, speaking of Chris appreciating things, have you read Harrison Greenbaum's book? I have not. Okay, but oh, I, buddy, that's full of good good stuff for Chris Angel in there. Oh is my it? god, I, he's like one of the funniest people, isn't he? Harrison? Oh, he's so funny. The idea that they did that as a fake tar bell. it's amazing. And dude, like it's it's relentless. It's relentless. <laughs> like absolutely useless for uh, advice and magic. Is that basically what? The <laughs> absolutely <is>? hilarious. <laughs> I do need to get a copy. Actually. It's just not good, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the funniest thing you ever read. But I'm like, I'm like, there's nothing of 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 substance in here. It's just nonstop hilarity. So it's that's great. him though. Oh, he was perfect. killing it in Vegas recently. Right? Oh, I went and saw a show at the Mad game. Apple Circus. Fucking amazing. I, I wanted to see it because I, 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 as a performer, I'm so used to kind of I'll, I've done cabaret, right? Yeah. Where you're in like the three people, the three sides to the room, but small, tight. Um, and I wanted to see how he handled working that environment because it was almost 360 it was almost right? in the round almost yeah because yeah. you come right over to the end of the catwalk and it's just basically yeah uh harrison greenbaum did no magic that's how he that's how he right. that's how he did it he's yeah. like i'm gonna do crowd work and comedy i think he did two tricks in the whole thing and those and both of them had uh the cameras punched up so you could watch on the the screen oh, so it was like it was more of like close-up mentalism type stuff okay um but yeah he did in the 40 minutes he's on stage he did two tricks and the rest of it was just crowd work and comedy. The guy's a fucking genius. He's great. Man. There's a guy in England called Danny Buckler who's like that, who just yeah. works off a crowd, oh, and he was just great. at Magic Live, and I think he did like 18 minutes with the top change. Yeah, it was yeah, that. That was it. So it, good. It, it, it. You know, I admire that. I really yeah. do because I my stuff is. Uh, um, it's tight and fast, and I like to get through it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I like to get through it and get off. I'm I'm more the other way. Like I like to. I will spend forever telling a story. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll just take these six minute detours in my show and just tell some story, a, like a hilarious true story that's happened to me. And people are like, some people love it. Yeah. But I'm very polarizing. People will be like, I'll, I I I got fired off a cruise ship once six years ago, for the, like I got off stage and they're like. That was really funny. I'm like, thanks. They're like, no, like the comedian was yesterday, and I'm like, oh, and they're like, we, we wanted a magician, yeah, and but I I killed, but they're like, nah. I did. So I I, like, I'm ah. touring. I'm about to go on tour with the Illusionists again, right? Oh and shit, right on. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. We'll be here in Toronto, so hopefully you'll you'll. Come oh, I'll see come it. through that for sure. And the first time I did it was my experience of, uh, I know when I'm on stage, like if I do, if I'm doing a piece. You, as you know, if someone gives you something from the audience, you've got to. You've got to. You can't ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> you, we've all seen those people who don't want to be thrown off their script. Yeah. But you've got to lean into it. Oh, yeah. And so the great thing about The Illusionist was I was doing three routines, I think, maybe four routines max. So I was getting really comfortable. And the routines were getting longer and longer because people, I was just leaning into stuff. And I would come up and I'm like, was killed it. You know, and the stage manager would be like, <laughs> we don't want to go over time you know yeah but and you're like, like well but what am was, i gonna was, i got it <laughs> there was a woman who, who kept following literally this old i said to this one the audience i was like i need a lady and this old lady stands up and she mrs b and she goes like i'm a lady and I'm, <laughs> so what do you do like so now she's like shuffling her way to the stage <laughs> And I'm like, this is hilarious. Yeah, you're like, I, I need some music. She comes on stage for my chuckle box routine, and I stand her there. And now I say, you stay here, and I'm going to go talk to this guy on this side of the stage. And I would turn out, she'd be over my shoulder. I'm like, get back to your place. What is, I want to see it. Like, it, was just, it was beautiful. I wish oh. it was, you know, but it made a 10 minute routine go 20. Sure. Yeah. You know, we had a moment in um, on tour where I would send the dancers out to bring assistance up so that yeah. nobody thought I was prearranging anything and I had this card routine and it feels weird to me to do a close up card routine for 5000 people sure me you too got a camera right yeah, but I think it's weird too it, but it works yeah, so it does. Like, great so we bring this couple up and um and he's like super pumped he's on this side of the table and she's sitting there and she's like this oh no and um so I'm like you okay she goes yeah. Okay. So I had him choose a card. Iva, she's going. She knocks the cards. I mean, she's just doing this. It wasn't like she went like that, but she knocks the cards out of my hands, and and then I'm like, "You don't want to be here, do you?" You know. And she goes, "No." And I I said, "What? Why?" And she goes, "I don't like magic." Oh. I'm like you, you, this is the illusionist. You do know it's the illusionist. Oh my god. And she goes, "Yeah, I bought him tickets for his birthday, but oh, I don't like magic at all." And she was really, and, and so now what do you do, right? Yeah. Because she's 
angry that she's on stage and now he's glaring at her like don't mess this up you're embarrassing me in front of 5,000 people and so two choices one is that you send her back to a seat because she's going to kill the whole routine yeah or lean into it oh buddy so I just I just was like tell you what I'm going to do I said I love magic I said and by the end of this routine I'm going to make you smile okay I'm, I'm, I'm she's like no i'm like i'm gonna make you smile and so uh everything i did i would then look to her for her approval and she'd be like and people thought it was hilarious oh, it's so was funny so, so mean right yeah she was just being harsh but it was now they were on my side of course get the audience on my side it's <sighs> us against her and at the very end of it i just i just remember this one moment where i do a card signed card ends up in a tic-tac box that she's holding yeah and and i and i always do this thing where i'm like you you have a look and tell me if you want to share this with everyone else because that reaction of seeing it's the card beautiful. sells it for everybody right so she goes like this she goes <laughs> and, and just that one and i was like got yeah, you yeah. got you <laughs> yes you, you've got to lean into it of course Again, 20 minutes later because sending her down would have been really hard to do like and and still like get that momentum back that would have been weird as fuck so you made the right yeah, choice yeah and you can't be oh. harsh to her because right that's the ungentlemanly thing to do yeah and you're it is and you're not just uh steve valentine's show you're part of this bigger wheel yeah. so you might be able to be a little bit harsher in your own specific show yeah but you're definitely right in that role. No, no way. I can't do that. It's a family show. Yeah. And, and, you know, in England, of course, you can, when people heckle or give you stuff, then you're in, expected right. to come back in kind. Yeah. As harsh as you want to be. Jimmy you know, Carr all the way. Oh, my like, God. Yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy's the man. Yeah, right? exactly. And um, so, but no, you have to behave yourself a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, so I'm looking forward to doing the tour. Come see it. It'll be interesting. I can't wait, man. That's fucking awesome. And you know about Magic on the Go? Do you know what I'm doing with that? Have Is you that your app? Yeah, it's the app school. Yeah, yeah. You, you talked about me when I was late for lunch last time. You talked. You, you, yeah, you, you, I want to tell about... you guys about Magic on the Go. <laughs> Do it, hit because it. Because we've been doing it since uh, 2017. It was like I think one of the first um, online subscriber Magic schools. Yeah. Originally, it was just mm -hmm. designed as a place to put all my DVD stuff for streaming, and then I realized that um, whereas like when you put out a product or you write a book, it takes time. You you have to oh, sell it. You got crazy you know, stuff that you know just to mail. If I had an idea or a concept or I found something in an old book or magazine, I could work it up, um, I could finesse it, I could put it on the site. Because yeah. I don't have to worry about selling it as, as, as this worth a one-trick DVD. Right, yeah, of and, course. And so then, um, as I, I, I like, love reading old magic books because I think the secrets of magic are getting lost, right? So I like yeah. finding these amazing things and going, have you seen this? Yeah. And then like from the 1920s, like doing it for people. Love like, it. What? Whose is that? And I'm like, the guy's been dead for a hundred years. Yeah, but, love it. Um, and so the site has just grown, and we now have. I mean, I have subscribers all over the world, but over 900 videos now. That is a. So when you sign up now, you get like a back catalog of like, holy yeah. shit. Yeah. When it and yeah. a couple of good ones too, even. There's a couple. Well, there's one or two good ones. <laughs> I keep the good shit for me. That's awesome. Uh, but no, I put every, everything. So and then I'll do like. Um, deep dives into a topic like I did with cards to pocket and I did mm. this like 120 videos on 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 all the techniques for that and then egg bag and diminishing cards and kind of these classics of magic and kind of like what are the older methods I'll like I'll like travel the world I'll collect the old props I'll find them I'll you know these um things that you, you wouldn't even know existed there's methods of doing stuff from years and years ago and then and some of them are just brilliant they just got lost you know a, a, along the way and then I do interviews. Um, I, I'll do, um, I, lo I love doing this thing called uh, Past Masters where I'll, I'll read, it's like a podcast thing, and I'll read uh, the written words of some famous magician from the past. Oh, cool. And uh, you have to kind of guess who it is, but also it's like as relevant today as as it was when it was written, you know? Yeah, that's... So, and I just have a lot of fun with it. <laughs> Man, you must come across some crazy passages though. Like, and if you see a woman unaccompanied by a man, right? Yes. Like shit like that must be just like... There's uh, there's some stuff by a guy called Will Goldston who yeah. was a prolific writer back in the day, but also he just ripped everybody off and put... <laughs> he would ask someone to donate a trick to his books. They would say no, he'd do it anyway. Oh my God. And he would sometimes make up his own methods. So his methods are somewhat preposterous and sometimes right. he would hit it, hit the nail on the head. Um, and then he's got this one book called Sensational Tales of the Mystery Men. It's a great title. That's really and good. just kind of like weird stories about magicians is basically what it is. Famous magicians. Oh, hell story. yeah. And it's a good book. And I was going to, and I thought, you know, it's, it's, um, it's in public domain. I thought maybe I'll, I'll do it as an audio book. 
Oh. And then so many of the chapters are like, oh, um, have offensive <laughs> language. <laughs> Things inappropriate things when we're talking about African Americans. Yeah, when we're talking yeah. about Jewish people or the way women should be. I'm like, I can't read this. I can't because they're gonna. Or can you? Or can I? I'll read it and I'll say narrated by. And then, Who do we hate today? And I'll just put that that, that name. Alan oh. Smithy is the oh, is the name. Fuck, yeah. that's wild. Yeah. So oh so the God. site's been great. It's been growing and and now we're adding a new app to it. Magic on the go. Magic on the go, man. Magic on it. the go. I love it. Um, that, that, that's it for this, uh, this, this, yeah. this episode. We're going to go on to the, uh, the, what do you call it? The Patreon. So, um, uh, I thought it was, I thought it was, uh, okay. No. Yeah. We got to go to the Patreon episode now. So we're going to carry on this conversation. Thanks Not for hanging fans, out with us. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking an only fans, man. That'd be a good spot for magic too. Honestly. Uh, come over there. Thanks for hanging out with us and, uh, getting to the bottom of it. Tell three friends. I know the uh, recording stopped on the uh, video, but the audio is still going. Yes. You can and, hear uh, us, but you can't see what we're doing. <laughs> exactly. All right. See you on Patreon, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Ciao. Bye. Bottom of the barrel. Bottom of the barrel.